In this video, I'm going to give you a walkthrough of setting up the PyTorch mobile runtime in an iOS project. To follow along, you'll need Xcode version 11 or higher on Mac OS, you'll need to have CocoaPods installed, and should also be using PyTorch 1.7 or higher to take advantage of the mobile optimization processes shown in this video. PyTorch offers native runtimes for iOS and Android, allowing you to bring your machine learning app to mobile devices. Including the library in your project is a one-liner, but there is more to do getting set up for best performance on mobile. In this video, I'm going to show you how to set up your project to include the PyTorch runtime, how to export your model to TorchScript, PyTorch's optimized model representation, how to further optimize your model for best performance, how to add your model to your Xcode project, and how to call the model from your code. Let's dive in. In this demonstration, we're going to build an image classifier into an iOS app. First, we'll create the project. I'm going to create a single page app with UI Kit UI. Now close Xcode and switch to your command line. We're going to add a pod file to the project. You can see here that it specifies libtorch 1.7. libtorch is PyTorch's C++ backend. The version you get through CocoaPods will be built for iOS. Now pod install and open the workspace, not the project. This is important when using CocoaPods. The next thing we'll need is a UI. I'm going to have one image view, one button, and one text view in my app. The image view and text view will have outlets in the view controller, and the button will have an attached action. Rather than making you watch me set up a bunch of storyboard constraints, we'll do a little movie magic. And then we'll go ahead and run the project just to make sure all is well. Now I'll show you how to set up and optimize your model for use with PyTorch Mobile. Now I'll show you how to prepare your model to run on the PyTorch Mobile runtime. You'll want PyTorch 1.7 or higher for this workflow. First, we'll need a model. For the mobile project, I have a pre-trained model ready to go, but I'll be demonstrating the optimization process on a custom model here to better show how you can apply this to your own models. This is a simple model containing a few common layer types. First, there's a section with a convolutional layer, a batch norm layer, and a ReLU. These are wrapped together in a torch.nn.sequential. This is a common practice to organize submodules within complex models, but we'll be doing it here to show how organizing your layers this way imp impacts layer fusion. After that, we have a linear layer and another ReLU. The forward function strings these layers and operations together in a pretty straightforward way. Note that I've also added quantization steps. You'll need to include these if you want to use quantization-aware training. Now we'll instantiate the model and put it in eval mode. This is an important step as it turns off computationally expensive gradient tracking and disables training-only features such as dropout layers. Looking at the structure of the model, it looks like we'd expect. All the layers we created, in the order we created them, with the first section wrapped in a sequential block. Our first optimization step is to fuse layers. Layer fusion combines multiple PyTorch modules into single operations, improving speed and memory footprint. Only certain ordered combinations of modules are allowed. For full details, see the docs at pytorch.org, but for this demonstration, we'll be fusing the convnet, batch norm, and ReLU, and we'll also fuse the linear layer and its following ReLU. We have to specify the layers we want to fuse by name. Note how the inclusion of our first three layers in a block impacts the names. We have to prepend the name of the sequential block with a dot to each of the names of the layers we want to address. This pattern would continue if the blocks were nested more deeply. Linear layers are not included in a block, so we just address them directly. Our linear layer is not included in a block, so we just address it and its following ReLU directly. Now we run fuse modules. Looking at the fused model structure, we can see that in each fused section, the first layer now encompasses the functionality of the whole block, and later layers are converted to identity layers, essentially no ops. The second step is quantizing your model. By default, PyTorch models use 32-bit floating-point numbers for weights and computation. Quantization converts the model to some narrower bit-width number, usually an 8-bit integer. 
PyTorch offers three workflows for quantization. Dynamic post-training quantization quantizes the model's weights ahead of time, but handles quantization of activations dynamically at runtime. Static post-training quantization quantizes both the weights and activations ahead of time. Quantization-aware training simulates the effects of quantization during training for added accuracy. These three quantization methods have trade-offs associated with them, which are discussed fully in the quantization documentation at pytorch.org. Here, we'll demonstrate static post-training quantization. To quantize our model, first we'll get a quantization config, here Q and NPAC. Note that this configuration is specific to ARM processors. This is what you want for mobile devices, but means you won't be able to run the model locally on an x86 processor after conversion. Next, we prepare the model for quantization. This sets it up for calibration. The calibration step is optional, but recommended. To calibrate the model, you'll need to run a representative set of data through it, much as you would for a training loop. This helps find the correct zero point and scaling for the float32 to 8-bit int conversion. Finally, calling torch.quantization.convert will do the actual quantization of your model's weights and activations. If you don't perform a calibration step, you'll get a default zero point and scaling factor, as we did here if you note the warning text. Our final step is to convert the model to TorchScript and optimize it for the PyTorch mobile runtime. TorchScript is PyTorch's optimized model representation, containing both your model's computation graph and learning weights. It allows the PyTorch just-in-time compiler and the PyTorch mobile runtime to perform runtime optimizations during inference. The PyTorch mobile optimizer makes further adjustments to the model that are specific to PyTorch mobile. Once we've converted the model with torch.jit.script and optimized it, we can save it. The file we save here will be the one we include in our mobile project. Now I'm going to pull in the resources for this project. Uh, they include the model, so in my case that's an optimized version of MobileNet v2 trained on the thousand categories of the ImageNet dataset. Uh, we also have a text file that contains the human readable labels of those thousand categories. And finally, we have an image file for our classifier to work on. There should be links to a sample project that includes these resources wherever you got this video. Now we can flip back to Xcode, and I'll add the three files to my project. Now, how do we call PyTorch from our code? Because PyTorch is implemented under the hood in C++ with libtorch, we need a wrapper for that C++ library. So we're going to go ahead and create a new group in the project. We're going to flip back to the command line, and I'm going to add these two files, uh, torchmodule.h and torchmodule.mm. Again, these should be available wherever you got this video. And then uh, Xcode is going to offer uh, to make a bridging header for me. And I'm going to let it do that. Go back to the bridging header and make sure we include torchmodule.h. So you can see here in the header, there are only two methods that are really interesting. Uh, one, which initializes the PyTorch runtime with a model, uh, which is stored as a file. It's our, our model resource in our project. And the second one uh, that does the actual prediction when you pass it in a buffer full of image information. And you can see the C++ bridge code in torchmodule.mm. And speaking of images, I'm going to add one more source file. And this is going to be uh, in addition to the UI image framework class that allows us to resize it more easily. Uh, the particular model I'm using, because it was trained on ImageNet, expects uh, three color images sized 224 by 224 pixels. So this helper will help me achieve that. Uh, we have some stuff to fill in in the UI view controller. Uh, first, I'm going to add uh, a lazy loaded instance of our module. You can see I'm loading it from the file and initializing uh, the torch module object with it. Also, I have a lazily loaded uh, array of strings, the labels, those uh, thousand human readable labels for the categories that the model recognizes. I'm also setting that up here. Now we're going to fill in the body of our inference buttons action. And you can see here, uh, we're going to load the image. 
I'm going to resize it to 224 by 224. Uh, we're also going to normalize it. So just as with the size of the image, uh, our model expects the image to be normalized in a certain way, and we have a method to do that. Uh, and finally, we take uh, our image buffer and we pass it to module.predict. After that, we retrieve the label for the predicted category and display it in our text view. And now I'll add my image resource to my image view so we can see what it is we're classifying. Oh, now, at last, let's run our app. And you'll see it starts up, and there's our kitten. We press the infer button. And be aware that even if you run this on a laptop, it may take a minute to run the first time. Ah, but there we are. Um, our model thinks that this cat is a cat. And that is how you get a PyTorch model onto iOS.